Welcome to the GNM podcast on M and G. My name is Gordy. I'm here with Michael. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done or done one of these, but uh, we're back now, and certainly a lot to talk about as the Flames have really not cooled down and have officially clinched a playoff spot now. So we'll just talk about these last couple of games this week to start off with. Starting off with a uh, pretty ugly six-one loss against Vegas, which I mean. Speaking for myself, Vegas is definitely a team you're wanting to keep out of the playoffs at this point, and the Flames didn't help uh, themselves in that game. So, so what what were your thoughts on that game? Well, yeah, it was just things looked off kind of from the start. The Flames did get up one nothing, but once uh, Keegan Coles are laid out, Chris Tanev, like the Flames just looked totally out of it the rest of the way, looking like they were trying to get their pound of flesh rather than finish the game, and. Yeah, it really cost them at the end of the day. They got off their rhythm. They took a couple of bad penalties that led to goals as a result of that play. And yeah, it was just not a good night. Like I think we really saw in that game how dangerous Vegas could be. Um, but at the same time, the Flames just weren't at their best. And those games will happen. But man, it was I think it was a bit of a wake-up call for the team that they can't get sucked back into those... Uh, those games where you try to run guys over rather than keep playing your game, because we saw a lot of that in the past with the team and it really hurt them. So now maybe, I don't know, maybe in the long run, it'll be a good learning experience before the playoffs here. But yeah, it was a pretty ugly game, pretty much start to finish there. Yeah. Like you, you mentioned, like even though Vegas is currently out of a playoff spot and haven't been all that good that this season, like, game just showed that Calgary's kind of exactly where they've always been on par with Vegas like they have not had a good time against them and should they should they make the playoffs like they have a handful of you know regulars that they can insert back into the lineup so yeah I agree with you it was it was ugly from the start like the Colasar thing was definitely mishandled by the refs I'm I'm not really sure what makes that not a major penalty it, I guess Tanev stayed in the game and didn't appear too hurt but it was a pretty pretty significant hit to the head but like you said the Flames have a couple of guys who just who take those penalties and uh, like in that situation it was Milan Lucic but you know more often than not it's Nikita Zadorov who's kind of taking these dumb penalties in games and in that Vegas one that was really the difference that uh, Dodonov power play goal was, you know, the game winner, and the Flames never really recovered from that. So it still shows they're they're definitely not a perfect team, and I mean, there's still a lot of growth before the playoffs. And I think a really really big storyline from that game was Jacob Markstrom being pulled for the second straight game, and he was clearly not too happy to be pulled out of that. He had a what appeared to be a couple things to say to Daryl Sutter on his way onto the bench and he threw a stick and smashed his stick down the hallway. But I don't know, like whether or not you can blame any of those goals on him or not, I, it really felt like his rebound control was poor that game. Like he had to make some pretty, pretty big saves in that first period because he was kicking out some needless rebounds and like his, his usage and play this, these past couple months has really, you know, taken away from his really hot start. We were talking about how, he put up, you know, eight shutouts in essentially the first half of the season and looked easily like he was on his way to cruising to the Flames franchise record. But, you know, now he's just has the one in, in the past couple months and giving up these early goals as he has in these last two games specifically. Like it's he's he's definitely shown a little bit of a different Markstrom than we were used to in those first couple months. Yeah, I think for Markstrom, it's just that he's doesn't have that same level of comfort he did. And I think I think to maybe to back him up a little bit, I think the Flames have been a bit more leaky defensively over the last month or so than they were earlier in the season. Maybe as they kind of settled into that top spot in the division, they kind of, things start to slide a little bit on that end. But yeah, to, to that game specifically, like I think it was just, I don't know, those nights were bound to happen. But yeah, he didn't look great from the start like you said I thought he was also kind of out of position a few times that led to him having to make some big saves which he also did make in that game despite I think it was what four of them beating him so like it was just one of those nights where nothing really clicked but then I I, I still don't know what to fully make of Vegas because just last night they went out and lost 3-2 on home ice to the Jack Hughes list like New Jersey who can't buy a save kind of team like the Devils who were just 
a mess through and through to finish out this season. And that, that cost them two points. I could very easily put them in the playoffs. Now I think they only have five games left. So I, I still don't know what to fully make of this team, but when you kind of look at the bigger picture, like they've won seven of eight right now with that loss being the only loss. I know they've all been against like non-playoff teams, but they've looked pretty solid. I would say in the other games, but yeah, it was a bit of a, I would say a wake up call overall because they are going to play some better teams here to finish out the season. Yeah, I agree with you. Like Vegas is, it's hard to put a like put a label on them because on one hand, like I kind of want them to get that third Pacific spot just to give Edmonton a much tougher first round matchup than I think the Kings might be. But like at the same time, like it's it's clearly a team Calgary struggles with, regardless of how they're doing against other teams and. Yeah, like, you, you, you don't want, like, I mean, we made the mistake in 2019 of thinking we can pick our opponent and, you know, having a pretty easy run. So you never know what happens in the playoffs. Speaking of uh, matchups that maybe went as we expected, the Flames came out and had about as bad of a start as you can have against, I guess, the second worst team in the league in the Arizona Coyotes, who who iced a pretty abysmal lineup that night. And, you know, despite giving up a goal 30 seconds in and having that be the only goal of the first period, the Flames came out ridiculously strong in the second and never looked back. And, yeah, we'll get some thoughts on that game, too, because I think, you know, despite the opponent and despite, you know, all the disqualifiers you can make for that game, like, they really came out for the last 40 minutes of that game and played some insane hockey. Yeah, I think it was one of those games where, I don't know, maybe they took them lightly coming into it. Like, they, there was no reason, like, really at all that the Flames should lose that game. So to fall behind one nothing early like that, I think, is probably another lesson they're going to have to take away. But, yeah, like you said, they came out roaring for the second period. I think it was four goals in just over three minutes. And then at that point, it's pretty much cooked. And then they kind of just kept piling it on after that. Um, yeah, it, it's a game they're supposed to win. Obviously, you're not going to win 9-1 very often, regardless of who you're playing. But... I don't know, it was nice to see some guys kind of get some goals that haven't scored as much in recent months. Like, I think Manjapani got one. Like, Dubé suddenly kind of taking off again, which is really nice to see. And, yeah, I think it was just a nice uh, confidence-boosting win, especially after that Vegas game, just to kind of have things uh, go the way they should and to just walk out with a pretty easy victory when it was all said and done. Yeah, you mentioned, like, a really good point there. Like, the Flames have had some pretty significant forwards have a couple of cool months as this top line has really carried them but three straight games now like Dylan Dubé has opened the scoring for the Flames he has four goals in total over those three games and like again it's Arizona but but those two goals he scored were both unassisted he picked two pucks off and came in and did it himself you know neither of them were particularly good shots but I mean he got he got the goal and I thought that was really good Blake Coleman is faced more than his fair share of criticism and he scored in back-to-back games now really nice goals Oliver Shillington I don't think has you know played bad per se or faced a lot of criticism but with some injuries and these these defensive pairings being kind of in flux over the last couple games seeing him get a couple points last night was really nice yeah like the key for the key for the playoffs is always depth like even the best players in the NHL very rarely score the way they do in the regular season and put up points per game. You need those depth guys to come through. And Manjapani, I think it scared us all a little bit. Like he was just so good at scoring the beginning of the season. And he really like, he really has not looked good the past couple of weeks. And then he scores two really good goals, like two really classic goals for him and has really started to turn his season back around. I think some of the forward lineups they've been icing recently with uh, Yarn Croak and stuff back in the lineup have really been more positive with, I think, it, who is it? Yarn Croak, Dubé, Coleman. Is that the line? That sounds right, yeah. Yeah, like they've been they've been very noticeable. I know Callie Yarn Croak hasn't been showing up on the score sheet maybe how we'd like. He still gets seemingly robbed by a goalie every single night, but... Just his his play driving, he's really good both ways. Really good face off guy. Like he's really um, coming into his own as that kind of third centerman, maybe even second centerman. As Michael Backlund still isn't still isn't all that impressive to me. But yeah, what are your thoughts on kind of the the depth guys on the Flames? Well, yeah, like you said, it's 
the playoffs are going to come down to the depth, and it feels like that third line, Dubé, Yarncrook, Coleman, like that's going to be the group I think that really decides whether or not this team makes a significant run because I think the top line is going to do what they do. They'll probably get you a guaranteed like two goals a night. Maybe you can get one from the backland line or like you'd hope so. But I think really if you can hit that four goal mark in the playoffs, that's going to be big. And that I think fourth goal is probably going to come from the Dubé, Backlund, Coleman line and or sorry, Dubé, Yarncrook, Coleman line. And Mm -hmm. it just feels like if they can get going, like especially Dylan Dubé and uh, Coleman, if they can start chipping in like one every couple of games just to kind of round out that depth, like it puts the flames in a really, really good spot going into the playoffs. And there was some concern that like those guys were having slower stretches, like you said, but yeah, if, if we see this kind of production where they can just kind of be relied upon to kind of be a good kind of two way third line, like I think it really sets the flames up to really kind of elevate themselves even more. So like, I think we've seen with Dubé, especially like in the 2019, 20 playoffs, he just kind of went on another level in that early in that Dallas series in that jet series. And I don't know, maybe he is kind of like another Sam Bennett that just has a different gear in the playoffs for whatever reason. But if he can bring that again, like, man, the Flames look really, really good, at least in the forward group. Yeah, they've they've also, like, switched up their power play units, which I, I you know, with the season Rasmus Anderson's having, like, him getting moved down to the second pairing is definitely not like a demotion. Like, they're really kind of spreading the talent out. Like, Dubé's now on that second unit. Mangiapane's on the top unit. Red Hot Noah Hannafin is now that the power play quarterback, which, I mean, did it like we might have seen like a Rasmus Anderson breakout coming, but did we ever think like Noah Hannafin was realistically going to be a 40 pushing 50 point defenseman? Yeah, I thought Hannafin, like, he's kind of had that potential there. And last year I think was a big step forward in his game, but yeah, right. Him and Anderson this year have both taken massive steps that I think Anderson, we were hoping for him to take that step because he's kind of struggled a bit, especially last season, but this year Anderson's taking that step. But yeah, Hannafin is just seemingly finding more and more kind of pieces to add to his game. Like, I don't think it's crazy with how hot he's been that, Maybe he pushes high 40s, maybe even 50 this year. I think he has nine points in the last five games. So obviously that's not super realistic for a defenseman to play even close to that pace. But yeah, I think Hannafin is just a player that I, I'm almost curious now high, how high his ceiling can be. Because on one hand, you kind of see how long he's been around in the league. I think over 500 games now. But at the same time, defensemen take longer to mature. He's only 25. Like It's kind of like a weird mix of he's young but he's experienced so you're kind of wondering like where his game can keep growing to because you would have thought by now kind of would have been somewhat figured but yeah I I I didn't see a like you said a high 40s point season from Hannafin this year I thought he'd be better than he was like maybe the last couple years but nothing quite to the extent where like you said he's anchoring the number one power play and just looking like a very solid like top pairing defender in the NHL. Yeah, and maybe shifting to a defensive pair that, I mean, has gone through the uh, the wave cycle of, of performances this season. They started off really low, really reached a peak around the Flames, kind of hottest streak of the season. But, like, in my opinion, like, Zadorov and Goodbranson are definitely kind of regressing a little bit to their early season problems where they're, you know, they're a little slower, they're a little defensively weak like the thing is is like I don't think I have a problem with either of them specifically I think each of them have their benefits and and negatives but I think it's just them as a pairing at this point that's a little getting a little bit dangerous especially with how well Connor Mackey's played which isn't surprising but how well Michael Stone's played which is very surprising like with those two guys in the box like switching one of them out on that pairing wouldn't be the worst idea just the lack of foot speed is is not being um, overshadowed by their physicality and their size. Like I, I've I've been seeing them get beat. Good Branson has been making a couple bad turnovers in his uh, own zone recently. Like I don't know, maybe it's just me seeing it, but like I don't know that pairing, especially with like Zadorov's penalty taking and power plays and the importance in the playoffs. Like clearly, the refs are watching him as an easy way to call a penalty when they have to, because the guy is just so big and so physically imposing. Like, 
all he has to do is wrap his hand around a guy who's a little smaller than him and it's you know it's an instant holding penalty and you know refs are not shy about calling him on that stuff yeah i'm right there with you i think that pairing is it's it's been so hard to gauge them this year because like you said they did they've been playing some pretty good hockey for the most part but have kind of regressed back to a mean of late that i think at, I thought probably coming into the season, like the way they're playing now could have been like best case scenario based on their kind of past numbers, kind of what we've seen from them in other teams. Um, I still think we see the Flames roll with them as the third pairing going forward. But yeah, like you said, Connor Mackey and Michael Stone have really, um, they've been both solid when in the lineup. And I think at the very least, those are the two guys you're looking at next year to definitely be on the bottom pair. Like they just look like a really good duo out there. And then... My guess would be both Sidorov and Good Branson are probably priced out of town by the time kind of everything's done this off season. But I don't I don't see Sutter changing them during the season as much as like we kind of want that because I think I don't know, they probably see some that he brings some things to the game that we might not. But yeah, like you said, that they're not at the level they were at a couple months ago. I think it's possible we see them get back to that, but I'm guessing the Flames are gonna be a team that kind of rolls three pairings pretty heavily all playoffs which you obviously need to do and i don't as a third pair i don't think we see them kind of get moved around too much but like if someone someone in the top four goes down i'd much rather see a a mac or a stone jump into that spot rather than elevating them to more ice time so i'm kind of like i would say i'm with you more but i still think like as a third pair they're okay but i wouldn't trust either of them with anything more than like third pairing minutes in the playoffs yeah, no, that's fair for sure. Like they've definitely done enough this season that they, you know, deserve their spot in the lineup and physicality is, you know, such an important aspect of playoff hockey. So yeah, like if they're if they're your bottom pairing, like that is definitely not the worst case scenario. Um maybe maybe we'll turn our attention to the bottom line because like Milan Lucic and you know the the perpetual circus or sorry carousel of guys that are coming through that bottom line like what what is kind of the ideal bottom line situation at this point there's there's a lot of guys coming in in and out of the lineup in that spot and just it doesn't feel like that line really ever ever is getting anything going on a nightly basis yeah i'm i'm right there with you i i don't really know what the expectations are for that line like I, I'm kind of torn on why they're keeping Adam Ruzicka around because Sutter has said before, if he's not playing kind of in the top nine, it doesn't really make sense to keep him here. He'd rather have him with Stockton as they're kind of getting ready for a run. But if they're keeping him around, I still think I'd like to see Ruzicka on that bottom line. I've liked Trevor Lewis most of the season. Like, I still think he's probably a pretty obvious candidate to be in the lineup on a regular basis. Like, I think of all the kind of, like, depth guys the Flames signed, like, he's probably been the best bang for his buck and kind of probably the only one I'd really consider bringing you on past this season. So, like, if you kind of look at Ruzicka and Lewis as kind of like your center right wing duo, like, I don't know, I thought Brett Ritchie, I don't know, he's been a little bit better of late, but I think there's only such a high ceiling. I I don't know, Lucic has been pretty disappointing over the last, like, 20, 25 games, in my opinion, but playoff hockey, Sutter hockey, like, at that point, I think it you you do more damage taking him out of the lineup, either on like a morale thing for the team, mm-hmm. or just like kind of getting away from your identity by taking him out. So like, if it was me, I'd probably do like a Lucci, Druzichka, Lewis fourth line and just roll that and hope they can at least uh, maybe turn some momentum your way, maybe get the odd chance with like Ruzichka and Lewis. But yeah, like you said, it's a pretty steady cast of like rotating characters that really haven't had success in kind of any form this year. Yeah, like the guy you didn't mention maybe is like like Ryan Carpenter. Like I haven't had like a particular particular problem with him so far, but at the same time, like he hasn't really done anything all that noticeable except, you know, maybe he assisted that one Gaudreau goal. In terms of personnel, I agree. Like like Lucic is what he is. No one's no one's um mystified by what that guy brings to the lineup every night. And you're right, like taking him out of the lineup could have certainly, you know, morale effects. We know how much the guys in that room love him. I, I've wondered for a while now why Michael Backlund maybe has never gotten the assignment as kind of the fourth line center. Like he's he's really good defensively. I'll give him that. He he plays a good two way game, but his offensive skills and his offensive vision, I just don't feel are applicable to where he plays in the lineup. I think he's he's often the weakest part of that Mangiapane and Toffoli line. 
And I think, you know, with what we saw earlier in the season, even if you're not comfortable playing Rizicka as the second center, like if you move them, like Manjapani Rizicka to Foley down to the third line and then play this really impressive yarn croak line as your second line and then move Backlund to the fourth, like I would I think I'd like to see that. Like, again, like Backlund's not playing particularly bad, but when you're trying to get like guys like Toffoli and Manjapani going, like I, Backlund is just not the play driver and the offensive producer that's going to complement those guys well. Where it, whereas it felt like Kruzicka played really well with those two guys and with these with everything more or less locked up for the regular season, like you know there is no harm to kind of experimenting with some lines. I know they've split up like that top line for that Vegas game to start with, and they've tried some other stuff, but. I mean, moving the centers around and, and maybe promoting Rizicka a little bit, who, again, like, I'm sure he's going to come out of the lineup in the next couple of days, but it, like, is a really performance-based. Like, I, I don't see that guy do anything wrong on a nightly basis. He's he's solid on the puck. He gets shots. Like, it'd be it'd be interesting just to see a little more shuffling like that. I, I think, personally, I think Backlund could be a pretty interesting aspect on that fourth line. I think he'd be a more solid veteran for Lewis and Lucic to maybe lean on a little bit. And yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on maybe just kind of shuffling some lines around. Well, yeah, I think it's important for a lot of people because like uh, to see that, um, because I feel like some people might get on and be like, oh, why is back on like your fourth line center? I don't think it's as important anymore to classify guys as like first line, second line, third line, fourth line. I think you want to create lines that are going to do a certain job for you when they're on the ice. And like you said, Manjapani and Toffoli are like, when they're on the ice, their main job is to score you goals and they're not going to be as great in the defensive end of the ice. And Backlund's not a great fit for kind of what those two are trying to do out there. Like he's still pretty good. He still get hit, still gets his few goals and points here and there, but I think, like you said, ideally you want a player that's a little bit more offensively focused to kind of center those two. And, like, Ruzicha would be kind of a a pretty obvious fit there. I still think we have to wait and see kind of how this shakes out. I think I would like to see Sutter try some stuff down the stretch here. And, like, honestly, yeah, Backlund between, like, a Lucic and Lewis, that would give you probably another pretty solid defensively focused line. Um, yeah, I think, like, I don't know, I'm... I'm kind of torn on it because, like, it feels like a huge demotion putting Backlund on that fourth line, but at the same time, you want your lines to kind of be doing their individual jobs out there in the playoffs, and I wouldn't mind seeing, like, some shuffling around, maybe even on, like, a within-the-game basis, depending on the situations. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll see a lot of that in the postseason where it's, like, if they need a goal, we see them, like, maybe load up a second line, and if they need to, like, defend a lead, we could see them maybe keep some of the more offensive guys off the ice and focus on defending, so... Yeah, I, I'm very on board with some changes or at least trying some stuff here. I think the Flames know more or less what they have kind of throughout the roster right now. Um, but yeah, if they can just do a few more like kind of in that middle six, maybe some stuff with the fourth line just to try it out. I'm all for it as they kind of wrap things up here. I know they're pretty close to clinching the division at this point. So like almost why not, right? Yeah, and on kind of the topic of trying stuff out, like, the Flames have done it in previous years with previous coaches to different degrees, but do we kind of see any AHL guys, in your opinion, get shots or just get a look before these playoffs start? Um, like you said, like everything is more or less wrapped up. Calgary nearly has like a 10-point lead on Edmonton now for the Pacific. They've clinched a playoff spot. They're not in any kind of running for the Western Conference, so... With you know, with always that looming possibility of injuries, do you want to see guys like fit like? And I mean, not you personally, because I know how you feel. But I mean, like, if you're Sutter, do you want to see like a Peltier, Phillips, Godden, whoever, like, get some NHL games and kind of just familiar familiarized with his system in in the game setting, just to you know, just under that chance that a huge injury bug hits like you don't want these guys coming and playing their first games of the season in the playoffs kind of thing well yeah i'm just kind of looking at like the ahl schedule too because obviously if you're calling i don't think we're going to see a lot of black ace call-ups this year just because stockton is also first in their division and getting ready for a big run themselves but um at least with stockton there i think their magic number for clinching their division is three games and then just with the way their divisional playoffs are set up they'll actually get a bye in the first round so like 
I don't see why you wouldn't call up some players. Like maybe they get like they could have the division clinched as soon as uh, this Saturday because they have three games mm-hmm. before then. So I know that last week of the year, that last road trip, maybe you leave a few guys back in Calgary, let them kind of rest up for the playoffs. If there's some guys, I'm I'm guessing like Tanem who are kind of banged up. Like I'm all for like giving guys like Pelche, maybe even like Dustin Wolf, maybe giving him his first start. Mm-hmm. Um, even I think they have two regular calls left, maybe three. I'm not sure. It depends kind of where Ruzichka's call-up ends up being. But, yeah, I, I'm all for giving guys a shot, especially if both teams have things more or less wrapped up. Like, I think it's it just makes sense. Like, even Matthew Phillips, like, I think at this point he's earned a couple more games just to try it out and then probably send them back to Stockton, let them take care of their playoff run there, and then, yeah, kind of go from there. But with both teams pretty much ready to clinch their divisions or, like, on the verge of it, like, it, it doesn't make sense to me to have your, like, young guys not – play at least a few of those final three games on that last road trip. So I, I'm all for it. How about yourself? Yeah, no, me as well. Like, you know, as important as playoffs are in any league, like at the end of the day, the AHL sole purpose is a feeder league and to help support the big clubs. So like if, you know, if, if the Flames suddenly need a left wing and, you know, Stockton is, you know, in the second round of the playoffs, like I don't think there's going to be any hesitation to call up Pelche or something as detrimental as that would be to Stockton. It'll be interesting what they do with Ruzichka because, like you said, if he's still being deployed as that 4C um, late in the season and come playoffs, like it would probably be best for everyone if he went down and played with Stockton and Carpenter and Richie and all them can come slot back in. But yeah, no, like I, it would be awesome to see Phillips get some more games. I really liked the one game he played last year. I think he was half a half a blade length from getting a goal on an empty net. So yeah, he's he's more than deserved it. He's eighth in AHL scoring. Um, the AHL scoring race is very comical. If if you've seen the leading scorer, he has 13 goals and 79 assists in 58 games, which is just some fantastic AHL stats. Yeah, it would, be, it would. I would love nothing more than to see Dustin Wolf get a start, but I think with the sp- the sparsity of uh, Vladar starts this year, it might not be the best look to have him sit again for another goalie. Mm-hmm. But personally, I would love to see Wolf play. He is he is just exceeded everyone's expectations despite how high they were already so yeah i mean the flames have had like i said they've had a history with other coaches of having this um black aces game in 2014 we saw sam bennett brett kulak a whole whole throng of guys come in and other seasons we've seen shillington make his nhl debut at 18 years old and so you'll never know. I mean, this is Daryl Sutter we're talking about. And if the Flames pl- ice their starting lineup till the very last game and play marks from every game at this point, like, I don't think we can be surprised by that anymore. Yeah, I think it's, like you said, it's it's Daryl Sutter. I think he's going to know what's best to get this team ready for the playoffs. Um, I think we've also seen the team talk about, or a lot about, like, especially I've seen, like, Gaudreau talk about, like, how they rested guys in 2018-19. That really bit them in the backside pretty quickly by the time the playoffs rolled around. So I don't think we see a ton of resting, but like maybe the odd guy here there, I don't know if that's enough to necessitate bringing up a couple of these younger guys, but at the same time, I'm all for it. I think it, I think it just makes sense for them to give a couple of these young guys a shot, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they kind of just let things roll between the two clubs, like kind of, they're both rolling pretty well. So I don't, I don't think we would see, or I wouldn't be shocked if we didn't see a lot of changes there. So I think on kind of a completely different topic right now, um, how awesome is it to see Mike Smith get like back-to-back shutouts and play really well? Because we all know this means he's going to be the game one starter come playoff time. And we know how that's gone in previous years for Edmonton. So how are you feeling about Mike Smith as your starting goalie if you're an Oilers fan? Yeah, I don't know. Because Koskinen Kostin, had kind of been their guy uh for a little while, despite the fact they almost ran him out of town midseason after like a few bad games, which is also hilarious. Like they were on the verge of running both their goalies out this year, yet that's what they're going to the playoffs with. So I, I don't know, good for him, but also like, yeah, it's it's it screams to me that things could just go off the rails very quickly in the playoffs for the Oilers. But lucky for them, they're going to probably have the Kings, it looks like, which is a far better matchup for them. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I could get very on board with the uh, rooting for a Kings upset win over the Oilers in the playoffs too. So yeah, I, I don't know how comfortable you feel like Mike Smith. What is he? he's pushing like 
38, 39 now. And well, I think he's in his 40s. <laughs> is he? I think he's like 41 or 40. He's oh, I geez, he's he, 40. Yeah, yeah, I think he crossed that barrier earlier this year. Oh my gosh, like I <laughs> he's had like he was pretty good last year, and like he's been all right this year, but yeah, geez. It's, it, it seems to be kind of his, like, his M.O. Like, I remember, like, David Riddick was more or less the Flames, like, main goalie during that really good 18-19 year. And then his his season just kind of fell apart in those past couple of months. And all of a sudden, it was Mike Smith out of nowhere who was that game one starter and pitched a shutout against Colorado. So mm-hmm. this is kind of what he does. But at the same time, he was decent in 2020. And, I mean, Edmonton got beat by a Chicago team that never should have won almost exclusively on his back. So, yeah, yeah if, I, if I'm an Oilers fan, I don't care how hot Mike Smith is going into the playoffs. Like, I would, never, I just don't trust him at this point. Yeah, Mike Smith is just such a strange goalie for me in that there will be nights where he can, like, steal you a 4 nothing shutout where he looks like one of the best, like, or a top five goalie on the planet. But then there'll be nights where, like, three goals somehow just, like, sneak through him on, like, shots that have no business going in. And the thing is, there's not really any way to tell what's going to come. So, like, I just don't know if I could deal as an Oilers fan with kind of that stress of you don't know what goal you're going to be getting mm-hmm. every night. Because, like, as we know with hockey, it's a sport that thrives on, like, consistency and all that. But with Mike Smith, you can never really tell what you're going to get on a night-to-night basis. So... I, I would be a little nervous if that was my guy or if that was my number one going into the postseason just because a couple bad goals in one or two games suddenly sinks your season pretty quick if he's uh, not uh, A-plus Mike Smith. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a scary day in Edmonton. And we've we've kind of written off the LA Kings as like the easier matchup for Edmonton, but like the, the Kings might not be great at scoring and they definitely don't have that like upfront star power, but... Like, they are really solid defensively, and they have two pretty good goalies. Like, when it comes to the playoffs, like, you never know how it goes. And, I mean, the LA Kings are more than more than uh, motivated to be the underdog with, you know, the LA Lakers have, are a bad basketball team now. Like, sports mm-hmm. interest is in flux in LA, and they're an underdog team coming into the playoffs. And the beautiful thing about hockey is anything can happen. Um, so we, we kind of talked about this a couple weeks ago, but with the uh, uh, playoff picture becoming just a little clearer, like have has your opinion on who you want to play or who's the most likely opponent changed at all? No, I think it's same as it was then. It's just down to Dallas and Nashville. And I don't know, something about Dallas still worries me a bit more than Nashville, just the... just the whole, like, the way they play, how they like to kind of just shut things down. That bugs me more, but, like... At this point, I think we just got to hope, like, or just roll with whoever the Flames get. I don't think Mm -hmm. there's a, I don't think I have a specific team I'd rather play more because Nashville, I think, has maybe a bit higher in talent, like, especially with their goaltending and, like, Roman Yossi. Forsberg's had a really good year, but, like, I don't like Dallas' style. So at this point, I'm kind of just leave it up to where things end up. Although maybe, like, just maybe we see Vancouver make a late push. That'd be fun. But I guess they'd have to get pretty wild pretty quick to catch up, but... I'm rooting for them just to, like, get into the playoffs. They probably wouldn't play the Flames, but, like, I'm kind of rooting for Vancouver to get things figured out because, like, they had a pretty rough start to the season, so it's been kind of cool to see them make this run of late. Yeah, and, like, given that, um, like, the Flames don't really have to worry about clinching a spot or, like, really fighting for the division or anything, like, I would almost, like, venture as far to say that they have almost a perfect schedule to close out the year. Like they have some really good measuring stick games, like two games against Nashville will be really important for them. They play Dallas as well. And like you said, even on that off chance, they play Vancouver, like they have a game against them as well. And I think this time of year, the most dangerous teams to play are the the teams fighting for that, those spots, like the top teams um, are kind of, you know, taking their foot off the pedal a little bit, you know, trying to save themselves health wise <laughs> And I mean, the the bad teams are always a little dangerous too, but they're also usually playing a lot of young guys and just playing to play good hockey. So fighting, like playing these really desperate teams in the last, these last weeks of the season, I think is really important. The Flames will stay sharp. They'll stay just as engaged in these games. Like the Arizona game is fun, but like that is nowhere near 
playoff hockey mm-hmm. and kind of the mood they're going to get. So fighting these desperate Nashville teams and Dallas teams like mere weeks before they might play them in the playoffs. Like, I don't know what the stats were, but I, I, I remember like that 2019 season, like they hadn't played Colorado for like months before that series started. Like, I think they played all three of their games like quite early in the year and Calgary had won them all or went two and one or something. And like their, their matchup just felt really stale and, you know, we hadn't had a good idea what they were like for a while. So having this kind of measuring stick where like, you know, Dallas, Nashville, Vancouver, Minnesota, like all these teams are going to be playing at their highest level and, you know, how the Flames match up against them is, is you know, it's it's almost like early playoff games, really. Yeah, I think, uh, especially the Nashville games, I think are going to be interesting just because Nashville is known for having a pretty good home ice advantage. So I think that would be an interesting test for them. Um, I wonder if we see Vladar start both games in Nashville just so they don't get a read on Markstrom before the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Like, I wonder if we see some games maybe played there by Daryl Sutter. But yeah, I think like, you were just mentioning like 2018 19. I seem to recall like not only did they like have things clinched pretty quickly, but they also didn't really play that many playoff teams in the final like seven, eight, nine games of that season. So, like, they were kind of going into the playoffs again, like you said, against weaker teams. But to have, I would say, probably their next five really with Nashville, Dallas, Vancouver, um, and then Minnesota too, who's right there. They're battling to get home ice in the first round against the Blues, mm-hmm. who are just looking like an absolute juggernaut right now as well. Like those to be five games that really get the flames, like keep them focused and keep them playing. And like, I wouldn't be shocked if they lose like three of these five, just because these teams are going to be way more desperate, but yeah, it's, I think it's going to be a far better way to prepare them for the playoffs. But at the same time, like, I don't know how many of these games they win just because these other teams are going to be so desperate and leaving so much on the line compared to the flames that they could fall a few more times. I think than we're expecting to finish things out. Yeah, so if the Flames play Vladar both games, does this mean now we're going to see David Riddick both games for Nashville? <laughs> yeah, man, I, I, I would be all in for like a David Riddick like uh, rematch game, although I'm, I've, I haven't checked lately, but I knew he wasn't having a great season down there. Like, like oh, that, gee, that, 83 that blow- save percentage for him. Yeah, that blowout game against St. Louis the other night, he gave up like four goals on six shots or something. Like, he's he has played, I think, less than Dan Vladar, who we always say, you know, hasn't played enough. I think David Riddick is like the least used backup, backup goaltender in the league. Yeah, it's uh, I'm just looking at his stats like a 3.4 goals against like five, three and two. It's uh, it's not pretty. I'm Maybe we're glad the Flames got a third for him when they did. But <laughs> which I guess turned into Dan Vladar. So we'll see what that turns into if they ever move Vladar. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'd be down to see Riddick at least one of the games. But with Nashville fighting like they are, I, I imagine we see UC Saros right till the end. And I don't know. Saros is also scary because like I think he's one of the goalies that would match up well with Jacob Markstrom if we're looking at like a goalie battle for a playoff series. Like I think Markstrom would have the edge over most of the other teams in the West, but Saros would just put the Predators on his back this year, almost like almost on like a Mika Kiprasov level of uh, mm-hmm. putting him on his back. He already has 64 starts. I would guess he probably ends up like 68 by the end of the year. And man, he's, he's probably right up there in that Vesna conversation too. So I don't know. That's why that's he's probably the sole reason I'm the most worried about playing Nashville, just because I think he is the kind of goalie that could steal a series. But um, I yeah, it's I, I think we're going to learn a lot the next like week or so when they play them twice. about like just how well they match up with Nashville. Yeah. And it's obviously like the central division. So it's like teams you play naturally less. But like that one game they played against Nashville, like I have. Like, I know they lost, but I have very little recollection of it. So it'll be nice to get kind of a read on these Predators, like, right before these playoffs. Like, this Matt Duchesne resurgence has been insane. Like, Roman Yossi, like, I never thought, you know, Kale McCarr was far and away running with the Norris at one point, And now, like, it's it's a two-horse race. So it'll be really interesting to see how Nashville plays. They're definitely probably one of the my teams where I have, like, the worst read on them, kind of what's going mm-hmm. on, how they play and all that. Dallas is a little fresher. Like, they've played twice. It's been a little spread out. But at the same time, Calgary's played two really bizarre games against them. And 
I mean, Dallas has always given them trouble as well. I'm not even, have they played Jake Ottinger against the Flames yet? I, I don't know if he's actually played the Calgary. So it'll be interesting if he gets the start to kind of get a read on him. And yeah, mm-hmm. like these will be, you know, sometimes these last couple of games as we're all excited for the playoffs are a little bit of a struggle and they're bad teams or really good teams. But I think it'll be, you know, these guys that are fighting for their playoff lives, like they all have Calgary and Edmonton and, you know, these these games circled on their calendars, like they're must wins almost for them. So it, we'll we'll see some good hockey for sure. Yeah, I, I just think Nashville is a team like it kind of felt like they were getting close to being ready for a teardown before this season. But I'd say they've, they've exceeded expectation. We'll see if it lasts. Like it's probably a team that without those resurgences from like Duchesne and Johansson, like you were talking about, like they probably missed the playoffs. So mm. I wonder if we almost see this as kind of like their last kick at the can. Forsberg's a UFA after this season. Um, I kind of wonder what we see. Some desperation maybe out of Nashville as they finish the season going into the playoffs. It always feels like the Flames in Nashville have like really entertaining games whenever they play, especially in Nashville. It always feels like it's like a 6-5 game. That's where Kachuk had the the between-the-legs goal. There's been games where I think it's like the Flames tied it in like the last minute and the Predators scored again like after that. Like just things like that. So... I'm expecting, like, two very entertaining games. I think they had that one where Calgary had something like a 5-1 lead, blew that, and then won, like, 6-5 in overtime or something a couple of, Yeah, I'm with you. Like, they're, they're always really fun games, so... Yeah, that's why I'm all in for them as, like, I think the playoff series. I think that'd be the most fun, but probably the worst for the heart, and I'm sure Daryl Sutter would hate it, but... Like, I think it'd be fun to watch, at least, although... I don't know, fun sometimes gets you knocked out in six, so I don't know. So we've been talking pretty much exclusively about like kind of team accomplishments, but man, like there are a ton of guys on like the brink of some really cool stats. Like the Flames are, you know, more than realistically it, potentially in possession of three forty goal scorers all in the same line, which, like, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Like, that's got to be like eighties. Like the last yeah. time that happened must have been like the eighties. I was look, I was trying to look that up. Like I don't even know where you'd start to look that up. But like three forty goal scorers on one line on the same team. Like that's got to be back to when there was like all the games were like six five every day. Yeah, no kidding. And like Kachuk has now tied his dad's all time best season. So you know he's going to be motivated to at least get one more. But like two hundred point guys on the Flames in one season, like. I think uh, I'm probably wrong on this, but like in recent memory, at least like nobody's done that except Drysaitel and McDavid. So, like that would be just insane if Kachuk hits a hundred. Like him and Matthews are from the exact same draft year, and they would hit a hundred points for the first time in their careers in the same season. And yet, you know, Kachuk is nowhere near talked about like Matthews. Mm -hmm. Just just kind of funny considering you know they're the same age and you know all this stuff like. You know, what a season for Kachuk. I know a lot of people write this off as contract years, but, like, I mean, that doesn't give you, like, superpowers or anything. Like, these guys are just as good as they look. Like, you know, Brad Treleving and their agents have done a fantastic job at keeping these, you know, upcoming contract discussions, like, completely untalked about. And I think that's just been huge for this team. It hasn't been a dis- distraction for one second. And, I mean, it, they're just so fun to watch and... I mean, you know, as much as Daryl might hate personal accomplishments, like seeing these guys hit these stats in our lifetime will just be exponentially cool. And it'll, it'll be it really hope they get them. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think I don't know. I think we're almost on like, can Johnny Gaudreau win the Art Ross at this point? Like he's at 107. <laughs> McDavid, it's at 110. I don't think it's totally crazy um, <clears throat> with how he's been playing lately. It's just. Like, he's just on another level, I would say, over the last, like, couple of months. And another stat I'm watching with him, I know people hate the stat, but plus minus, like, plus 61, that's a number we haven't seen since Wayne Gretzky. Like, he he's had the, he's right there. Like, he, he hit 85 even strength points, which was the highest since, like, Yager in 96. Like, if you're in the same conversation right now as Yager and Gretzky, like, it's been a good year. It's not just a contract year, like you said. So... I still think he's got to be right there in the heart conversation. I know Matthews, like, especially if Matthews hits over 60 goals, although he's missing tonight, I just heard. Um, I still think he probably edges out Goudreau for it. But, like, any other year, I think it's Goudreau, like, in the heart, like, winning the heart, almost no questions. But I think at mm-hmm. least it'll be close now. Maybe we'll see a Jerome again, the Jose Theodore-esque, like, <laughs> somebody left Goudreau off their ballot in Toronto kind of thing or something. But... 
Um, yeah, he, he's just been so ridiculous to watch. And then, like you said, Kachuk, like, I can't remember who said it on Twitter, but it's got to be, like, the quietest 100-point season in NHL history where, like, nobody's talking about the fact that he's, like, a the number six player in league scoring right now. And re- really, like, it's... We, we always knew Kachuk, like, was going to be a good offensive player, but, like, I don't think anyone saw him ever hitting 100 points in, in a season. Like, that just seemed like a level above where he was ever going to get to. But, yeah, 40, 40 goals, 100 points, that'd be a, a real nice bookend to, like, what's been an amazing season really for the whole team, but especially that line. Yeah, like, it's, you know, we, as as kind of younger Flames fans who never got to see those 80s teams or 90s, you know, early 90s, like, you know, during our lifetime, Jerome McGinley's really been the only guy who's been a, you know, a really good scorer, and he never even hit this, you know, triple digits. So, getting to live through this stuff is just so cool. And I mean, not no matter what happens the season, but kind of no matter what happens the season, like this will be a all-time, you know, great Flames moment. And these guys are are quickly etching themselves in, you know, the all-time greats book. And yeah, it's just such a pleasure to watch them every night. Can't wait till they get the uh, uh, Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane contracts, and we can just forget about this and move on. Yeah, that's that's the dream. As much as it's gonna like totally kill any chance of like doing much, if you're paying them both like eleven million dollars a year, I think you just do it at this point. Like, yeah. if you, as long as you can keep this top line together, like at least the two more years Lindholm has on his contract, I think you just gotta like bite the bullet and do it. A line this good is going to give you a chance to win, I would say, minimum 45 games a year, like pretty much in their sleep. So I, I think this team is just un, – unless – I think the Flames just they, – they got to offer whatever dollar amounts they can to each of them and work around the rest of the team after that. And if they leave, they leave. But I think, mm-hmm. I think they're going to do everything in their power to make them both want to stay. And really, if you're both those players like, – I, I don't know. I just come back to this argument all the time, like with Goudreau, especially because everyone always talks about, like, oh, he wants to go to like the East Coast, but like, is there really a team right now or a coach like that's really unlocked that could unlock his potential, like Daryl Sutter has in this line has? Like, obviously, everyone talks about, like, oh, Philly, New Jersey, because that's where he's from, but both those teams are in complete chaos right now. Um, I don't know. The Rangers have some calf space, but like, I don't see that fit really happening with the number of like other good wingers they already have on that team. Mm-hmm. So. I, I think the Flames will do what they can. I think they make their best pitch they can if he leaves, so what? But um, I don't know. if it Also, if he leaves, I guess they're going to have a lot of money to do other things this summer. But I, I really hope they do whatever they can to make him stay. Just just back up the Brinks truck and maybe make like four Brinks trucks while they're at it because he's just been <laughs> otherworldly this year. Yeah, and like you know, regardless of like if Brad can sign them or not, like he deserves all the credit he he can muster for. You know, the Flames are not in cap hell and have the ability to sign both these guys, and you know, most likely Shillington and Mangiapane too. Like he's just he's built these these such good contracts that he's put himself in a position that we're not like, well, like Johnny Gaudreau is going to cost too much. There's no way he's sticking around. Like we have that hope that he sticks around and. You know, his parents are always in Calgary. His wife's from Calgary. Like, he seems to genuinely like it here. So it's definitely never going to be a John Tavares situation. Like like you said, if he leaves, like, he, you know, he deserves to play wherever he wants to play. And no matter what, he'll always be, uh, you know, an all-time Flames great at this point. So, I mean, we just got to enjoy the rest of this season and kind of not think about the impending sadness should it come. So... Yeah, that's probably a good good spot to leave off of as we yeah. get ready. Sadness, yeah. <laughs> as we get ready for uh, playoff hockey now, we'll definitely try to make another one of these before that starts. Uh, kind of recap the regular season, talk about guys' seasons and all that. So, uh, yeah, so we know you guys are watching this on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe to this channel and we'll come out with more content. Check out matchsticksandgasoline.com. We have some other podcasts there and... Yeah, thanks for watching.